Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm I'm back in Zoom now, John. If you can try that first, we'll see if that works. And if it doesn't, I'll I'll try you on the Skype. Mm. Okay. Well, hopefully we've sorted it out. Still no audio, eh? Right? Well, oh, you there you go. Hang Perfect. On. Let me turn off my phone. Hang on. Okay, my phone is off. Can you still hear me? Oh, we're great. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Oh, okay. we, what was the problem? I don't know, but nothing to read. Hey, my computer guy always tells me the uh, first thing is reboot, right? So that's, that's well, that's, that's solved everything for us. That's what I did. I, re I restarted. So there you go. Okay, so if you're ready, I'm ready. Is there anything you want to stay away from? You don't say you don't sound like no, it avoids I, any issues ever. I, no, whatever you ask, I will answer. I, Okay. I don't stay away from anything. And what? It's ten after twelve, or what? Do do one do till one o'clock, or ten after one? Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, whatever's comfortable for you. All right. I will. You know what? Your introduction is going to be too long. I don't want to waste your time going through all your accolades oh, and accomplishments, right. there, Mister. Uh... Well, what you should do is you should start recording now, and whatever you say <laughs> is fine because. I was always my most successful gym when I was going live, when I originated the first morning talk show on ABC in LA, when I was first in America to review movies on the news, uh, I was live. And then when I accidentally created Real People, um, the first reality show, it was live the first couple of years. So really? I, yes, so I love live and wow. so, if you're recording now, good. Now let's just get going. Yeah, yeah. I saw a clip of you with Red Fox. Was it on you, your YouTube channel? Man, he was just such a character. What a great show that was and a, a great interview. Oh, well, thank you so much. As a matter of fact, Red Fox was my mentor when I started as a stand-up comic when I came down here from Toronto. I left I came from a very, very dysfunctional family long before it was popular. And I left Toronto when I was 17 to come down to uh, uh, Las Vegas originally to become a professional gambler. But when I eventually decided that I was going to do stand up comedy because I wanted to do a talk show because my hero was Jack Parr, who was by far the very greatest late night talk show host in history. And, and what he did is he did an opening monologue. So when I started, my wife, whom I met during my second professional performance at the Hungry Eye in San Francisco, she was Earl Father Hines' band singer. Earl Father Hines is the godfather of jazz pianists. He was in, uh, he was in Louis Armstrong's sextet, but he didn't like Louis's lifestyle, even though he loved his music. He went to San Francisco, created a big band, and my wife became his singer. And she also, because of that close association, became a close friend of Red Fox and Dick Gregory, 
And it was Dick Gregory who did the liner notes of my first album called It's Tough to Be White. But uh, when I got my first real talk show, the first, one of the first, he was the second person I booked, Jim, was, was Red Fox. Wow. If, you want to tell, if you want me to tell you the, who the first person was, I'd be happy to tell you that story too. So anything you want to ask me, I'd be happy to tell you. And that clip, by the way, I say in the clip, if, if anybody is watching, Red Fox ad-libbed accidentally the funniest line ever, ever in the history of television. Now, Jack Benny supposedly has the record for the longest laugh line in the history of radio. There was a fellow named Sheldon Leonard who always played gangsters. You probably saw him in old black and white films. Came, became a very, very famous uh, producer, Gomer Pyle show and a bunch of other shows. But Sheldon was uh, always played a gangster and he appealed, appeared on Jack Benny's show and Jack Benny had a reputation for being extremely stingy. And on this one show, he's walking down the street and this gangster Sheldon Leonard says, pulls a gun and says, your money, wife. And then there's a long, long pause. <laughs> And then he repeats, your money or your life. Another long pause. Now he gets angry and he said, hey, buddy, your money or your life? And Jack Benny says, I'm thinking, I'm <laughs> thinking. Okay, well, Red, when he came on the show, people were afraid to put him on television because he made his living doing party records in the Chitlin circuit. That's what, what they call the black entertainment circuit at the time. And nobody would put him on because he was filthy, but he was funny. And, I, and often he was extremely clean, unbelievably witty. He and Jackie Mason were the two wittiest ad-libbers I ever knew. Anyway, he used to do a routine about black power and white power. And uh, he said he did not care about black power or white power. He said he just worried about green power and then he said because if you if you have the green you can buy the places where the whites and blacks hold their meetings which was really funny if you go to my site or you can google a uh, red fox uh, on john barber show or go to www.johnbarbersworld.com you can see a lot of unbelievable stuff, even when I was on with Sinatra, on with Dean Martin, and all the rest of it. And I knew Red's act very, very, very well. And when he came on the show, you know, Jim, what they call those short or long pants that uh, Scottish golfers wear, and they have their yeah. socks, and they well, and their pants are tucked in. I don't want to. You know what they're joke. called? Yeah, I don't. No, want no, to no. Joke. Okay, <laughs> they're called they're called knickers. Okay, so That's anyway, a fan from YouTube. I, yeah, okay, they're just called knickers. N i c k e r s. So when I introduce Red, and you see him walk out, he's dressed beautifully, but he's wearing these knickers. And uh, we had another comic on who, who ran over to him and tugged at his pants like that and said, what's this, what's this? So Red said, I was down south in Mississippi and I heard him saying knickers all the time, so I bought me a pair. Well, of course it got an ovation and he sat down and what he sat down, he sat down to talk about his long relationship with Malcolm X. They both, both grew up in uh, uh, St. Louis. They both went, both went to prison together. But before we got to the part about Al Malcolm X and how they used to sleep on the street and on hotel tops and all, all the rest of it, and they were in jail together, I asked him about the black and white thing. And when he talked about green power, I... I don't know why I asked this, Jim, but I said to him, hey, Red, that's funny. Why do you think money is colored green? Now, anybody else would have been absolutely and totally stumped, and I was embarrassed and ashamed of myself because I thought, God, I'm gonna ruin the guy's act. Without missing a beat, he says, that's cause Jews pick it before it gets ripe. 
Well, you could almost, you, we, couldn't, we couldn't continue with the show. The laughter was so loud. People literally fell on the floor, pounding the floor. And Jack Carter, who was the other comic, when the, when the laughs died down, he'd pull out a $20 bill and start waving it. I picked some. I picked some. So anyway, it's a wonderful moment. And as a result of that, it led to uh, his being seen by Norman Lear. He ended up with a small part in the movie and ended up doing Sanford and Son. Sanford and Son was a ripoff of a, uh, or an adaptation. I hate to say that Norman Lear and Bud York and ripped off anything, but it was called Steptoe and Son in England. Oh. And they adapted it to Red Fox. Well, Sanford is Red's real name. His real name is John Sanford. Oh. He called himself Fred because his older brother had died. And as an homage to his older brother, he called himself Fred on the show. Wow. And he was my only lifelong friend in show business. And I knew everybody, knew them all. Wow. But he was, he, he and Harlan Ellison and Neil Simon, the playwright. Now, do you want to hear, do you know who our Harlan Ellison is? No. Harlan Ellison, uh, Harlan Ellison, do you know who Nabokov and Ray Bradbury are? Bradbury, I know that, yeah. Okay, well, that trio, they comprised the greatest science fiction writers in America. And that was Nabokov, Ray Bradbury, and Harlan Ellison. Now, uh, Harlan Ellison, uh, when, uh, when I uh, was a comic, I ended up getting on the Merv Griffin show on Westinghouse. You remember the old Merv Griffin show? Just barely. Yeah, he, yeah well, <laughs> I, I have to talk to hosts who are a lot older than you <laughs> after this. But in any event, Merv Griffin had the most, second most successful talk show. Carson, of course, had the first with The Tonight Show. And Merv Griffin was sponsored by Westinghouse. He was so successful, CBS hired him away to do a late night show. I had been a regular on Merv's show, and he had tried to produce a show with me on ABC. He was going to host, the, I was going to get my first talk show on a ABC, but a very smart manager by the name of Jack Rollins, who managed Woody Allen, also managed Dick Cavett and happened to weasel me out and get Dick Gavitt on. But in any event, when Merv went to CBS, he recommended me as his replacement. So uh, uh, my wife was pregnant at the time. Uh, she was about seven or eight months pregnant with a child, I must say, I never wanted. And the reason I never wanted, was because I came from such a bad family, I didn't know what kind of father I was going to be, but why I happened to give my wife a child which she wanted i wanted show business she wanted the child i'll tell you that story in in a little bit because it's a very nice story anyway i substituted for merv one night mm. and i my ratings were almost as high or higher than merv's because i did a stand-up and merv would just sing he was freddie martin's uh band singer at one time mm. at the time the president of westinghouse wanted um David Frost. Do you remember David Frost in England? Wanted David Frost to take over the show. And I contacted them and I said, listen, do a, um, a uh, Scarlett O'Hara Gone with the Wind search. He didn't know what I was talking about. I said, well, you know, Selznick shut down the movie so he can find his Scarlett O'Hara, which turned out to be Vivian Lee. Find four other guys like me, put them under contract and give us each a night and then announce to America that you're looking for the new host to replace Merv Griffin. And it'll be a monster hit because you cannot have an Englishman hosting an American show with all the controversy that's going on in the country. But anyway, uh, that the reason they picked David Frost is they could go to England, they could go to 10 Downing Street or Buckingham Palace. And so they signed David Frost. Well, I got a call, uh, I got a call from a guy named Chuck Young, who was the general manager of the Channel 11 station in Los Angeles, the guy who put Joe Pine on television, 
who was America's first angry man. Now, I know you've never heard of Joe Pine, but he's the guy that started all the angriness in television. And Chuck Young said to me, I think that David Frost is going to bomb, so I'd like you to replace him. I mean, I, we know he's going to bomb. I want you under contract here so that when he does, Bob, we have you. And uh, he said, could you do a Saturday night poor man's tonight show? And I said, it'd be my first talk show. Jim, I was so happy. I was going to get my dream of becoming the next Jack Parr from Canada. I mean, unbelievable. And as a matter of fact, I was in the country illegally twice. I was deported twice, which is strange and magical how all this happened by accident. Anyway, if I knew that television was the electronic umbilical cord that would bind the world and nourish the world, either nourish the world with information or destroy the world with misinformation, which indeed it is doing right now, but not at the time, not at the time. Uh, it, television, when I got into it, was absolutely Fabulous. Anyway, the first person I wanted to talk to was Harlan Ellison. Harlan Ellison was writing a television column for the Los Angeles Free Press, a very radical anti-war magazine, and the column was called The Glass Teat. What a perfect name for a critic, sucking on the television set for your, the milk of human kindness. Anyway, when he, he happened to review my appearance on Merv's show, and he wanted to know how Westinghouse could find his fag to replace Merv Griffin. Oh my God, I read that, and I was devastated. But I kept reading, and God, could that guy write? It was really <laughs> funny. I mean, it was hilarious. So I, my producer was Bill Walker, and I said, Bill, we've got to have a regular on, a regular, every Saturday for five or ten minutes just to talk about television. He said, what a great idea. Who do you want? And I said, Harlan Ellison. Oh, God, you've got to be kidding. I'm not calling him. I said, well, I'll call him. So I looked in the yellow pages. There was his number. I dialed. He answered on the first ring. This very angry voice said, yeah. And I said, Harlan, this is John Barber. And he said, oh, shit. And I said, oh, wait a minute. You've already said that in writing. So can I ask you a question? He said, are you, are you really John Barber? And I said, yes. And the question is this. Can you talk as well as you write? He said, what a stupid, bloody question. Of course, why are you asking? And so I explained to him that I was going to have this show on Channel 11. Chuck Young was going to give it to me. I'd like him to come on and talk about television. He said, are you kidding? He said, I'm not gonna change my comments or opinion about your performance <laughs> on the first show. I said, I don't care, you can bring it up, it's great television. Yeah, I yeah. said, a matter of fact, the greatest radio shows were Fred Allen and Jack Benny, and they always were attacking one another, so people used to tune in to see what they would say and how they would insult each other. Anyway, he comes on the show. Everybody in town <coughs> knows who Harlan Ellison is. He writes the best uh, Star Trek scripts. He, he wrote uh, that, uh, they stole the idea of the uh, 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 Terminal, what's that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? Terminator. Huh? Terminator. The Terminator? Yeah, a quick story about this. You know, he wrote a short story called The Terminator and Paramount stole it turned it into a script and it made a Schwarzenegger a star. And so he hired a lawyer to sue. Everybody in town, including his wife, his agent, his manager, publicist, don't sue, you'll never work again. He said, I'm gonna sue. And he sued and he won the suit. And it was so big, Jim, he could afford to take out a huge billboard at Sunset Boulevard in Doheny in Hollywood, a big sign that said, I beat the bastards. And he never worked so much in his life because oh, really? Hollywood only loves winners. So there you go. Anyway, wow. everybody in town knew who he was, knew what he had said about me, so they tuned in to watch the show. Uh -huh. We got a great rating. It was a wonderful show. Chuck calls me on Monday, and he's giggling. 
And he said, John, gosh, congratulations. I mean, that was just wonderful. Surprised to see that the show did so well because you're really not that well known. Even you're on Merv's show and Dean's show and a few others. Not many people know you, but they know you now, thanks to what you're giggling. And he said, oh, you'll never guess who was just in my office. And I said, who? He said, Harlan. I said, oh, terrific. Are you going to give him a show? And he said, no, don't be silly. I said, you've got to give the guy a show. I mean, television is really important and nobody's more articulate or savage than he is. And he says, no, I'm not giving him a show because the show he wants is yours he thinks you're lousy now okay so my show goes for eight weeks and is canceled because evidently david frost is doing okay jim from that point on every talk show i did after that the first person i called to be on my show was harlan ellison wow that's a great story how much do you think your comedy today would pass like if you stood up and did what you did in what was it 1965 you did your act there. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's tough being white. That yes, a, that, that was the that was like a, a like today's Netflix special, a live recorded to to comedy album, right? Like to vinyl, was it not? Well, yes, and you know, uh, I must say that political correctness is really bad in my country, the United States now. But I was in oh, Canada it's worse here. Recently. You know what? I was just going to say it's a whole lot worse up there. It is. Uh, uh, because, uh, first of all, the firing of the most interesting guy in the National Hockey League, except for a couple of hockey players, mm. was Don Cherry. I mean, I, I could not understand what all the fuss was about and why they got rid of him. And somebody in Canada said, well, he was getting too much money at Rogers thought he was getting a million dollars which or eight hundred thousand which was too much money and i said that he should put a cap on his earnings so i said hang on a second as a government step in to put a cap on the rogers earnings no. i mean there that's one of the richest families in america don't be crazy and i said and the other thing that i hear i won't mention his name he's a very successful canadian actor he starred in a sitcom up there a while ago and i don't want to get him in trouble but he was telling me when I was in Toronto that a bunch of gay groups and women's groups and all kinds of political correctness groups are getting together to try to get Shakespeare out of the public schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, shame on Canada. Goodness gracious. And when I was back there, I have a friend of mine, Leno Sanic, who, who you should have Len on your show. He comes out of Vancouver. He's a best searcher alive right now in broadcasting. It's called Black Op Radio. He's also a great musician, records a lot of bands in his studios. It's called Piasco Brothers Studios. When I was there three weeks ago on my book tour, which went really, really well, by the way, I went down to watch one of his recording sessions. And there are five musicians sitting around arguing about the fact that there's so much coverage on Canadian television about the fact that Trudeau years and years ago as a youngster in some kind of Halloween show or some kind of makeup show, just a party for the evening, dressed in blackface. Mm -hmm. And one of the musicians said something I thought was really bright. He said, you know, the problem now is our media is becoming too Americanized which is so true because there was absolutely no more freedom of press in the United States, which I'll get into it in a minute. But I stuck my head in and I said, you know, that's a brilliant comment. And you know, I'll tell you something, you guys are making a whole lot of fuss about Trudeau, your president, a prime minister who years ago, years ago, went around for one day in blackface. How do you think it's like for me in America, we got a president running around every day in orange face. So, so we, don't, we, don't have, it, we don't have an orange ethnic group to offend though. <laughs> yeah, well, if it, the, the tough to be white stuff, if you go to my site, I must tell you a lot of it is unbelievably topical today. Right. And there is absolutely and totally nothing that is offensive to, to blacks, as, an, as a, a quick sidebar to this story, 
when I recorded the album, there were only two people who would either talk to me about it or put it on the air. One was Bob Crane. You remember who Bob Crane was? Oh, yeah. Tell the folks who he was. Hogan's Heroes. Right. Okay, well, before he got Hogan's Heroes, he had the most popular talk radio show in Los Angeles, and he loved the album. And he called me and put me on the air, and we played excerpts from the album. And of course, uh, the LA Times said it was the worst taste album in history. So I sent the critic a note and I said, you're supposed to listen to it, not eat it. And, uh, and Joe Pine heard us and Joe Pine, who hated everybody, here's a Marine who's lost a leg, hates the world. He started this thing called the Squat Box and he'd let get people get up on his show and squawk about anything. And usually he'd tell them to go home and gargle with razor blades. I mean, he was really cruel, but he had me on his show and I, I got to I uh, got to play it. I had been booked into because Dick Gregory took the edge off of it by doing the liner notes. He loved the album. And that's why it started to get some traction. I was booked into the Playboy Clubs. And I was booked into uh, one in Miami. I was uh, booked into uh, one in George, I was very, very successful. But before I get to LA, guess what? They had the Watts riots. And the Watts, I mean, really, really bad. The city was shut down and cops and, and National Guard were all over the place. So Lee Wolfberg was the manager at the Playboy Club. And I walk in there and he's holding a magnet in his hand, like, uh, like Clint Eastwood in 30 hours. He says, you're not doing any of that. Tough to be white crap in this club tonight. You better find the stuff that you used to do on Merv Griffin that's safe. So you're not gonna say a word, okay? And he puts down the gun in the drawer and that's it. So I get up on stage and the, uh, the, 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 the club was about three and a half stories, four stories above Sunset Boulevard. So you could see all of Los Angeles, and you could still see the smoke. We had huge wall-to-wall -wall windows at the top of the club. They were tinted, but you could still see the smoke. And I was introduced by a, a black fella named George. Gave me a wonderful glowing introduction. And I got up on stage, and his introduction was so nice. I couldn't help myself. And I said, you know, George was just made manager of this Playboy Club this week. So everybody applauded it. And I said, he's doing a wonderful job, isn't he? I love the introduction. They applaud again. I said, well, you know, last week he was a busboy, but since the riots, they don't trust him around the knives and forks. Well, they, the audience cheered and he jumped up and down in joy at the joke. And then I looked out the window and I said, you know, I'm thinking of that old song as I look at, uh, look at uh, confident smoke gets in your eyes. And then I said, you know, it doesn't take much electricity to light up Los Angeles, just one watts. Well, again, there's huge applause. And I'm just uh, living this stuff. And I thought, they like it so much. I'm going to do the album. It was one of the first times I got half of a standing ovation. And I thought, my God, I'm going to be a star. I'm going to be a hit because it was, the, it was like Lenny Bruce who became successful doing what they called sick humor with Lenny Bruce. And I got off stage and there was Lee again with the damn magnum in his hand. And he's cursing at me. I'm not going to tell you what he said. He said, you either change your act or I'm going to shoot you because we were going to shoot them. That's how bad it got. Or you're not going to play here anymore. And I said, listen, you know, 10% of that audience was black and you saw George, they absolutely loved the stuff. He said, I don't care what they like. I don't like it and you're not gonna do it. I said, what if I prove to you that black audiences love it? He said, I don't care what you do. I said, you know what? I'm gonna go, go, go do it in Watts. And he said, you're nuts. And I said, I have faith in my material and I have faith in my audience. So I went to Ebony Magazine on Wilshire Boulevard, there were, and, and I met the editor. I didn't meet the publisher, I met the editor, and there were three guys in the office, and I brought my album. 
He said, let me listen to the album. I told him the story. The very next day he called. He said, are you sure you want to do this, Mr. Barber? Because I can set you up at the most popular club in Watts on 100th Avenue in the heart of the Black District. But are you sure you want to do it? And we'll do it on a Saturday night. I said, I am sure that I want to do this. So he said, okay, we'll set it up. My wife and I drove down there by ourselves. We were met by the owner of the club, an elderly black gentleman who said, ordinarily I'd have the MC introduce you, but because it's so important, I want to introduce you. And they brought cameras, they brought everything down there. The place was jammed. Now, if you've ever seen Apollo, the greatest and the worst audiences to perform in front of are blacks. And a lot of great black talent was discovered at the Apollo in New York City, owned by a Jew, by the way. And a lot of careers were destroyed because black audience, they're brutal. I mean, they'll throw stuff at you and they'll yell at you and even try to get you off the stage. But it's just wonderful theater. And when they love an act, oh my God, like Ella Fitzgerald or Billy Eckstein, I mean, they just go crazy. So anyway, I have to, it's amateur night at the club. So I have to follow a really bad black ad that does a horrible imitation of Jerry Lewis. I mean, it was just embarrassing. He did big lip jokes and watermelon jokes. I mean, it was a god awful embarrassment. I mean, if had I done it. And he, he got a number of boos, uh, a couple of mild chuckles, and his name was Buzzy. <laughs> so anyway, when it's my turn to get up, the owner of the club holds up the album, and the audience sees the title, and they kind of hiss. And he said, our brother, Dick Gregory, wrote the liner notes to Mr. Barber's album. And he's been having a very difficult time in white clubs trying to do his, his material, which mm -hmm. our brother loves. And he wanted to come down here and present it to you. And uh, I want you to listen to what it is that he has to say. So I get up and I'm telling you, I am so nervous. And one guy says, one guy hollers up. You having a tough time following Buzzy? <laughs> he said he was tough act to follow. And said, I said, you know what? I'm not going to have as tough a time following Buzzy as the police do. Well, they just screamed. And then I started. It was the only really full standing audition that I got. So I go home and I think now. Dick Gregory was made by accident, Jim. He was a sit-in at the Chicago Playboy Club for $50 for a private function. And a writer from Time Magazine happened to be there, loved what Dick, Greg, Dick Gregory did, put one paragraph in Time Magazine, and Dick Gregory became the black Bob Hope. I mean, he was a monster star at the time. I thought that Ebony Magazine would now do the same for me. Everybody loved it. I mean, there was such an ovation and they took the film and the video and the audio. And I, I thought, oh my God, I just love this. I'm so excited about this because now people won't think that I'm a bigot if I start doing the material. I wait two weeks, three weeks and nothing happens. I never hear from them. So I called the editor, Jim, and I said, is it coming out? And he said, John, I've known for a week that it's not coming out, but I didn't have the heart to call you. So I'm, I was going to call you honestly. And I said, why not? You saw the reaction. He said, if I could publish it, I would right now. I think he said, I think it's so important, but our owner said, you're not publishing it because it rekindles conversation about racism. And so you're not going to publish it. So it, it was never published. And I thought my career as a comic is over. I never did the black tough to be white stuff again. But the very next day I got a call from the producer of Art Link Glitter's Talent Scouts. And he had heard about uh, Watts. 
he had heard the album and he called me and he said, do you think you could do a few minutes of material that's not from your album? And I said, yes. So I went down and auditioned. He put me on the air the next night. Now, have you ever heard of a comic named George Goebel? No, I don't think so. Oh, God, I need older hosts. Anyway, George <laughs> Goebel. Uh, George Goebel oh, had one of the most successful sitcoms ever in America. It's called The George Goebel Show. And he was sort of a country oh, fellow. But, God, he was funny. But he was a notorious drunk. And in order to make the show popular, even though Art Linklater, a fellow Canadian, was hosting it, um, they would hire major stars to introduce the talent. So if there was a singer that was auditioning, they'd get Vic Damone or they'd get Vicky Carr, somebody to introduce them. And introducing me a comic, they hired George Goebel to uh, introduce me. So he came into my dressing to introduce my, himself and he brought a bottle of bourbon and two glasses. And he said, I came kid to help you celebrate your being on American television really, really for the first time. And so let's have a drink. And I said, Mr. Goebel, I don't drink. I said, he said, I beg your pardon? He said, why not? And I said, first of all, it has to do with the drunks in my family. I don't want to get into that. But I don't drink, and I probably never will drink. And he said, how can you go out there alone? <laughs> so, so he said, I'll toast it for you. Well, I did so well, Jim. I was one of only two acts ever brought back to Talent Scouts. And Art Linkley was so proud of that fact that he introduced me himself. And if you go to my site or you Google John Barber on Talent Scouts, you will see the complete eight or nine minutes of that ad. And the opening line of it was a very, when I started to become a comic, I was 30. I was in the country illegally. And I didn't know if I could write. I didn't even know if I was funny. So I got all the comedy albums, everybody's, Jonathan Winters, Mort Sauls, Lenny Bruce, Bob Newhart, who worked on the phone, and Shelley Berman, who did the phone. They were fabulous. But I couldn't be them because they were themselves, and they had a distinct identity. I had no identity. There was nothing unique about me as there was about them. And so I got a dozen uh, joke books. And I read all the joke books, but the jokes that were good, everybody knew. So I said, I could do better than that. And in 10 minutes, I wrote my first five minutes in the opening line was, hi, uh, my name is John Barber, and I'm being brought to you right now through the courtesy of the NAACP, which was a courageous thing to say at the time because they had all these sit-ins all around. And then I said, the National Association for the Advancement of Canadian People. And then I was off and running. So my entire act became my observations about America as from coming from Canada. And that so, ended up being the album that was pressed to vinyl then? Uh, it, uh, the yeah, no, the, the Tough to be White one, I never did again after that because oh. wouldn't, they wouldn't let me do any of it on television. Right. I've never done any of it on television. But it should, it's more topical today than it was then. You think you could get away with doing it on TV today? You've seen Chappelle's show probably. I mean, he's... Yeah. Uh, oh, he's, absolutely. He's, absolutely I could. If, if the people that would be the most nervous would be the white folks who, because I'm expressing a lot of what white folks are thinking but don't want to say out loud. And I d do it in a very, very funny way. And, what, do you and, think, what do you think the uh, outcome of... What? Oh, what do you think the outcome What'd you say? Of, I said, what, do you, what are your thoughts on what this whole cancel culture... Your, your video's freezing up. No, okay. This is my internet. It's unstable. I wondered... Your you video me? was freezing up, so I didn't hear you. Yeah, I just wondered what you... Yeah, think, I can hear you now. What are your thoughts on this cancel culture and the politically correctness of today's... I mean, we've always had certain sensitivities. It's, it seems to be... goes in and out of subjects and people and whatever. But, I mean, I, I agree with you. I... I I like the days when we used to grind the hell out of each other, whether it was in the rink or on the playground or the, the sports field or whatever. I mean, it was, and at the end of the game, we're all just guys. So yeah, I just wonder what your thoughts are. You see, you could get away with doing it today. And Rogan's, you know, Rogan's got an edge to him and, and Chappelle, although he's black, 
can get away with you know yeah. that specific racial slur but it, it just seems like it's the death of you know i really appreciate your thoughts on television because it seems like the death of television it, when i hear you talk about the early days of tv it sounds to me like it was a much more i don't know pure uh, for lack of a better time uh, description it seemed like a pure well the, re the reason is if it, uh, jim the reason is very simple when the television box was invented they had to have something to put on the air to sell these boxes and what are they going to put on the air? Well, they go to all the old established vaudeville acts, Milton Burrow and Jack Benny and Fred Allen, and they put them on the air. And then they realized, well, you know, there are a lot of bright people on, on radio who are talkers. So they begin to put talkers on the air. They put Reverend, uh, they put Archbishop Fulton Sheen, a, a Catholic cardinal, they put him on the air and he became the number one show in America. He bumped off the number one comic who was Milton Burrow. I'll tell you something a very, very, and, and you'll, uh, the, my book, Your Mother's Not a Virgin, The Bumpy Life and Times of the Canadian Dropout Who Changed the Face of American Television. And indeed I did, it's the creator of the first reality show. It's an unbelievable story, but when, John Kennedy was killed. You could only own five television or five radio stations or five newspapers in America. When right. he was killed, there were 1,500 different owners of television and radio stations. When I was a kid, in the 50s, I could hear a guy named Father Coughlin. He had a network radio show the most bigoted human being probably next to Adolf Hitler that I ever heard on the radio. He hated blacks and he hated Jews. And yet he had this very popular radio show because at that time it was called the public airwaves. It is not any longer ever since the murder of John Kennedy and Jim Garrison's investigation, he solved the murder but was shut down when he won his perjury case against Clay Shaw. Those stories are not also, also in the book, but you can also go to my site and see all that stuff for, for nothing. There used to be something, well, I'm gonna tell you how, it, how it, and why it vanished. Jim Garrison had solved the case. The Central Intelligence Agency said murdered our president, and he was gonna prove it in court. He announced this in 1967, but the, uh, the, the media and the government prevented him from getting into court for two years. He finally got into court on January 29th, 1969, a couple of months later, lost the, lost the conspiracy case against Clay Shaw, but he won the perjury case. He had a slam dunk case. They, they had a witness who had been paid $25,000 by Clay Shaw to murder him. And... That would have sent Clay Shaw away forever. And they had a bunch of homosexual uh, $20 male hookers talking about their deviant homosexuality as homosexual acts with David Ferry, uh, Lee Oswald, and Clay Shaw. Now, Garrison never presented this in a conspiracy case because it said it had nothing to do with the conspiracy. But I knew that Clay Shaw, this respected businessman, doesn't want these witnesses in front of a jury that think he's this golden boy of New Orleans, this successful businessman, he would have confessed rather than having his life destroyed and the government knew it. So they stepped in illegally and shut down the case. And they also tried to sabotage him. A guy named Walter Sheridan from NBC who worked for the FBI and CIA was sent to destroy Garrison's case by getting his key witness moved, his name was Perry Raymond Russo, getting him a job for $50,000 in California. Well, Garrison wired him so that when Walter Sheridan met with this kid, it was audio taped. And he had a criminal case against NBC and Sheridan, so he had to get equal time. They had an equal time clause at the time. He went on late night television. It's in the movie, The American Media, and the second assassination of President John F. Kennedy, and described and proved how 
Oswald could not have been the killer and it was the Central Intelligence Agency. Well, the owners of the country, and the Americans don't own America, Canadians don't own Canada. There are half a dozen families on it. They say, we can't have this kind of truth on television. So they got rid of the Fairness Doctrine and the worst president in American history, Bill Clinton, signed the Communications Act in 1996, turned 95% of all American media over to six corporations. The reason I made the second documentary about the American media was because when Donald Trump was running for the presidency, now you remember he might have said to uh, Ted Cruz, he said, your father was in New Orleans helping Lee Oswald distribute leaflets. Well, in the uh, Garrison files that I have, we find that indeed a guy who has his father's name uh, is arrested distributing those leaflets. And so we got also Trump is talking about fake news and he sounds like Garrison. So I go back. I have a three hour interview that I did with Mr. Garrison, September 5th, 1981. And I listened to it and it sounds like Donald Trump. And I said, I have to make this documentary. And I did. Now, the business of fake news. Donald Trump could make America great again only with his pen and in one minute without firing a shot or firing anybody. An executive order reversing Bill Clinton's Communications Act do not let any person or corporation own more than seven radio or television stations or newspapers the way it was when I started the AM show in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And I'll tell you again how powerful the equal time clause was. Do you know that I was the first person in America to review movies on television? Did you know I, that? I learned that from but, researching it a little bit. Yeah, I didn't know it before. Well, right now they're as common as weather girls for crying out loud, but I was the very first one. Now to show you how powerful the Fairness Doctrine was, if you were a producer or an author of a book or a, a playwright or a musician, and you came out with a new work and the critic decimated that work, you could ask either the newspaper, the television or radio station for equal time and management could decide whether or not to give it to you if they decided against you, you could take it to court. Okay. That was the value of free speech at that time. Right. Anyway, there was a movie called Soylent Green with uh, mm -hmm. Charlton Heston. Do you remember it at all? I've never it's a that. science fiction mm -hmm. film where people are reduced to, uh, where people, human beings after you can get three squares a day. I mean, a god awful movie. Well, I absolutely decimated the film. And I'm on the air with Tom Snyder at six o'clock at night, and I begin to feel bad because I'm crucifying this film and getting laughs, which is easy to do when you're angry. <laughs> and so I stopped myself. And I said to the audience, I said, I said, you know, that people who make movies don't deliberately want to make a bad film. They're all talented folks, and there are hundreds of them working on a film. And sometimes it's just an accident and it turns out well, like Casablanca was a total ad lib accident. And it turned out to be one of the great movies ever made in Hollywood. I said, so I'm going to try to say something nice about this film. The sets are beautiful. And then Jim, I was ashamed of myself. And so I added, the sets would be more beautiful if they'd been placed in front of the actors. Well, I got an absolute scream. And Tom Snyder, when we went to the commercial break, said the only really funny thing he ever said is an anchorman. He said, some of us will be right back. Well, any, in any event, the producer of the show at 20th Century Fox called Bob Howard, the general manager, and said, you better fire Bob right now. Otherwise, no more ads from 20th Century Fox. And Bob Howard said, you know, then no more ads because my wife loves Mr. Barber. Okay, so I got to stay on. Now the producer calls back because he's filing a lawsuit and demands equal time. Fairness doctrine. And Bob Howard turns him down again. So he takes it to the courts in Los Angeles and they rule against him. He takes it to the California Supreme Court and they rule against him. It was in the courts for five years, Jim, 
until the Supreme Court ruled on it. The only movie review that ever went to the Supreme Court, they also ruled against them. And guess what the Supreme Court said? The Supreme Court said, we are turning you down because John Barber's re movie reviews are of absolutely no public importance. Wow. So there you go. There you go. But that's how powerful the media wasn't. And Clinton uh, or Trump is probably a slam dunk to be reelected because the, the Democrats, uh, I mean, you want to know something? In Poland, they do American jokes. <laughs> That's how bad American politics is in this country. And it looks like Donald Trump would be a slam dunk. He has not reversed the Communications Act. And, and I'll be very curious to find out if indeed he does once he has a mandate for the, in the second term where nobody can get rid of him. And also, I must say, even though they have all this nonsense about impeachment, Donald Trump is the least impeachable president we've had in the last 40 years. Bill Clinton should have obviously been impeached, not only for his peccadillos, but he had 87 women and children murdered at Waco. And then you have George Bush with Iraq. There were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, destroyed that culture, and now we have 15 veterans committing suicide every day, shooting themselves instead of George Bush and Condoleezza Rice and these war criminals that started it. And then his father over Iran-Contra. Do you know that when Carter was president, he had already secured the release of the American hostages who were seized in Iran. And now that you had Ronald Reagan running as president, and you had the former head of the CIA, George Bush, running as vice president, he became traitorous. He went to the Iranians and said, don't release them until Mr. Reagan is elected and we'll give you a better deal. And it became known as Iran-Contra. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. Well, in the movie, you see him saying, if people knew what we were up to, they would chase us down the street and hang us. And even, even uh, 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 Eisenhower, the beloved Eisenhower, who warned us about the military-industrial complex in his last speech before John Kennedy became president in '46 and had to take on that extremely evil force. I mean, Eisenhower, who was beloved and a general, could have shattered him into a thousand pieces all by himself, but he didn't, he didn't do that. And what few people know is that in 1952, Iran had one of the greatest democracies in America. They had elected a socialist named Mossadegh who nationalized British petroleum because the, the English were taking 85% of Iran's oil. And he said they should only take half. And Eisenhower sat down with the Dulles brothers and said, you gotta get rid of them. So the Central Intelligence Agency murdered them. And they murdered Salvador Allende also in Chile. And so Richard Nixon should have been impeached and probably hung for that. For Donald Trump to make a phone call that is probably only politically incorrect is not an impeachable offense. They just don't like him because he is a totally unlikable human being. But that has nothing to do with what it is that he's doing. Yeah, the, impeachment, not, the impeachment inquiry is uh, profound. Uh, it just uh, blows my mind because they have the transcript. You can see right there in black and white that there's not anything impeachable. I, I, that's I, it. That's it. That you're, you're absolutely right. And, and of course, this Russiagate nonsense. Now, I hate to be coming to the defense of Donald Trump, because I'm <laughs> agnostic about Donald Trump, you know. Right. But the thing, the thing is that he has said a couple of wonderful things. Uh, one that was really, really quite human. He said it three weeks ago, and I hadn't heard talk like that since John Kennedy. You remember uh, about a month or so ago, six weeks ago, there was a drone supposedly sent from Iran that blew up one of the Arabian refineries. Right. Donald Trump was on national television sitting down in front of his desk and he said, you know, I just got a notice here from uh, our Pentagon and they gave me a list of 12 targets in Iran that I should attack because they sent the drone supposedly to blow up the refineries in Saudi Arabia. And then I had this notice from the prince. Now this is the prince who is, he's very friendly with the prince that ordered the murder of that 
New York Times newspaper man whom they dismembered. But he said they get a notice from him saying the missiles came from the north, so they not, must have come from Iran, and you should attack them. And Donald Trump takes his finger and he taps his desk and he says, you know, it'd be so easy to push a button and it's over with. He says, but I'm not going to murder thousands of innocent people when we don't know that this came from Iran. That's the first time since John Kennedy, the first time a president of the United States has stood up to the overblown and bloated military industrial complex. It got John Kennedy's head blown off in Dallas because he was withdrawing the 12,000 advisors monthly from Vietnam. That's what got him shot in, in uh, Dallas. But in the film, John, uh, Jim, uh, something interesting is said by Jim Garrison. Your name's Jim, his name's Jim Garrison. Jim Garrison uh, says that, uh, that the Soviet Union was the first cold, fake Cold War because they lost 25 million people and all their infrastructure was totally destroyed. They were no threat to the United States. The biggest threat to the United States, as Eisenhower pointed out, was peace. He said, because if you have, you know, a million and a half men coming back to make automobiles and refrigerators and telephones, how many can they make? They make a new model once a year, but you can have a new bomb every two seconds. It costs them thousand dollars. And they created a thing called Project Mockingbird, the CIA, to infiltrate all of American media to promote the threat of communism, which was a fake in Vietnam and in Iraq and every place else. Now we have fake terrorists. They have no country. I mean, we could at least bomb Iraq or we could bomb uh, Korea or we could be, uh, bomb Vietnam because they identified this as where these terrorists lived, even though they were also fake terrorists. Now, we have this thing where almost anybody in the United States, Jim, can be called a terrorist. You and I could be called terrorists just for having this conversation for crying out loud. Yeah, it's it strange, and, and, and I'm frustrated by the fact that when are they going to when are they going to label Antifa a terror group? I, I mean, these guys are in black masks showing up to events, but like you don't. So I, you know, I'm I'm socially a lefty. I've run. I don't know, seven or eight times for the Green Party here in Canada. It doesn't get any oh, more Oh, good for you. Good it for you. It doesn't get any more left than that. But then, you know, uh, you know, I was 24 when I started with the Greens. And, I, you know, I've had more time to think about the issues and debate them and see them debated by smarter people and say, hey, well, yeah, I'm really off on that. So I've come right. N number, number one for me is free speech. Don't tell me, like in Canada right now, you can't make fun of, you can't even criticize Islam as it's long as long. We have a law against that. It's just, it's, it's crazy. And I, I hate to interrupt you. Could I tell you something really interesting? Hmm. And, it, and, and you probably have heard this. Tulsi Gabbard is one of the uh, Democratic. Uh, of Tulsi uh, Gabbard. Uh, 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 one of the hopeful. And there are two things in her favor. One of the things is that she is very, very strongly opposed against war because she fought in them. Even though they were fake wars, she thought maybe 911 was a real threat when it obviously wasn't Saddam Hussein, so now she knows she's opposed to it. Yeah, but she's to me, the most enlisted, actually. Yeah, the most interesting thing uh, she said, she said a month ago. Yeah, she said, the first thing I do if I become president is I drop all the extradition charges against Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. Then I drop all the charges against Ed Snowden and let him come back to the country of his birth. Otherwise, what good is the First Amendment? I would vote for anybody who would do that because there is nothing more important than being informed. At the opening of our film, Thomas Jefferson is, is quoted as saying, you can't have a functional working democracy unless you have an informed electorate. And you cannot have an informed electorate unless you have free speech. And then John Kennedy more recently says at the beginning of the film, we believe in an absolute free flow of information. And any government who does not allow this free flow of information is a government afraid of its own people. We do not have a free press in the United States, and obviously 
being a smaller country. You're just, you're just a, a, a regional office. The United States is still sort of headquarters and every other country is sort of regional office. But I was expecting a, a whole lot more freedom of speech when I was up there in Canada. Now, I look upon the internet the way I look on a box of Cracker Jacks. It's full of, full of nuts and it's full of corn, but at the bottom of the box are a couple of prizes and you can find them and you're one of them and there are dozens of others like you. Uh, I think there's somebody up there called Pretty Polly or what's her name, Amazing Polly or something like that. I don't know if she's right wing or left wing, it doesn't matter. She's free speech wing. And that's the only wing that we need to be concerned about. So well, anyway, Second Amendment, I'm so, well. so delighted that you had me on your show and we must, we must do this again. Can I plug my book again? Absolutely. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Barber. Go ahead. Plug it. Uh, okay. Uh, it's called Your Mother's Not a Virgin. <laughs> Bumpy Life and Times of the Canadian Dropout Who Changed the Face of American Television. And it is it's the a, fellow that did the forward to the pages? book. His name is Donald Jeffries, a brilliant writer. Oh, my God. It's 700 something pages. Wait a second. I got to tell you this story <laughs> there is uh, okay okay john i, I gotta tell you because it's a, true after every it, story there's a wait a second i just gotta tell you this one more story you can tell stories all day john. Uh, yeah well the thing yeah well there, there there are no chapters in the book okay it's all done as a series okay. of columns now let's say you, you love uh, lenny bruce and you want to know about lenny bruce oh, okay. you can just go to lenny bruce and, and read it but Donald Jeffries, who has a number of bestsellers here in the United States, wrote the foreword. He said, Jim, the greatest book ever written in the English language is David Copperfield, Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. And he said, John Barber's Your Mother's Not a Virgin is David Copperfield Goes to Hollywood. And I must tell you, and I tell you this very immodestly, it will be the best most entertaining, most informative book you could ever read about anybody who's in show business. I mean, here's you got this juvenile delinquent in Canada who's arrested and convicted of crimes a couple of times in Canada, deported from the United States twice, once when he's 19, once when he's 29, and he's broke when he's 46. And a year later, as the most successful show in the history of American television, becomes the Boswell to tell Jim Garrison's story, and Frank Sinatra's private writer for four and a half years, and then is prevented, presented in 1977, his, finally, his citizenship papers by California Senator John Tunney. And Charo, who used to be the Mexican girl that was married to Xavier Cugat, came to the inauguration of me and sang the national anthem while she played her guitar. Wow. It was hilarious. Oh. So anyway, it is a fabulous book. If you want to know how it got the title, I'd be happy to tell you. Otherwise, we'll do it next time. No, I, I was going to say, is that another way for saying, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> well, the way it got the title. The thing is, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, uh, Jim. I'm a storyteller. And when I was yeah. a kid on the uh, when I was a kid on the streets, I used to go to the Manor Theater on Kingston Road for a nickel. And I could see a double feature and most of them, everything was made in Hollywood, right? But there were stories. Do you remember Lorne Green? Yeah. Lorne Green was on the CBC when I was a kid. This Orson Welles voice telling stories. And there was a Canadian writer named Gordon Sinclair. I devoured every one of his books. And as in the sixth grade, I was assigned to read his stories of real people to the class. So that kept me alive. And now that I'm older, it's the telling of stories that keeps me alive. Mm -hmm. And I thought that Jim Garrison's story was the greatest untold story in America. I was going to add what seems to be your fascination with getting to the bottom of the JFK assassination. Like, because it's a story. Yeah. It's, an, it's, an, it's, it's, so, it's so patently obvious, you know? Mm -hmm. You know what Americans and Canadians suffer from now, the public? We all suffer from the Stockholm Syndrome. Do you know what that is? In case people don't know what it is, 
you have millions of battered women being battered by horrifying husbands or mates, and they stay with them. And psychiatrists call it the Stockholm Syndrome. We have in the United States a totally inept, corrupt government. And, and, and Donald Trump was elected, first of all, his big advantage was it wasn't Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. I've had two friends move from the United States before the last election because they thought Hillary was going to win. <laughs> so, and they're still, they're still out of the country. So there, there you go. And people that I play golf with who voted for Trump say it's the lesser of two evils. Why vote for an evil at all? Don't vote at all. Boycott the election. Wouldn't it be wonderful if 90% of all Canadians, Americans, boycotted the elections and let the 1% fight over it? You would find the 1% would be so terrified. They'd think, oh, my God, there's going to be another another French revolution and they're going to bring a guillotine to us. We better change and improve the system. That's the only way it'll be improved. It'll never be improved by a president because the president doesn't run the country. Anyway, when Garrison lost the case, I was it was over for me. Okay, so what? I believe the government. I want to become to this country. I believe in this country and Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart movies, you know. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I love the place. I love the people here. I love the performers here, everything about it. It was headquarters, so I forgot about it. I was in a bookstore, Edmunds used bookstore on um, Hollywood Boulevard across from my favorite restaurant, Moussa and Frank's. And there was a book called Heritage of Stone, written by this guy, Jim Garrison. So I start to read it and I'm stunned, I'm spellbound. Four hours I stand and read the entire book. I learn that the Zapruder film has to go to the Supreme Court because Time Life won't release it to Garrison for his trial to show a jury in New Orleans. And then there's a, a doctor named Fink, the only forensic pathologist at the non-autopsy of John Kennedy at Bethesda. And when he's in court, he said, we were prevented by admirals, generals, and FBI from looking at x-rays or looking at films or even doing an autopsy. So if you go to the Warren report, you won't find any x-rays, you won't find any photographs. You find two cartoon drawings of John Kennedy's head with a bullet in the back and a bullet coming out the front. Well, I called him and booked him on the show. And he said to me, you'll never get away with it. I've never been on television without being hindered. And I said, Mr. Garrison, I've just won an Emmy. We are the most successful morning show in America. We are live, I'll do a half an hour with you. And then the other hour, we're gonna take phone calls and I guarantee you, we could be on the phone for eight hours. He reluctantly agreed to do it. And while we were talking, Jim, he said, John, it's 1970. Do you know that six years after the Warren Report, 81% of all Americans don't believe the Warren Report or that Oswald acted alone? And I said, well, Mr. Garrison, then why aren't you people taking to the streets? And he chuckled. He said, well, you didn't see the second question in the Harris Bowl. I said, what was the second question? And the second question was, would you like to see a deeper investigation, one that includes investigating the FBI and the CIA? And he said, only 23% could live with that. What does that tell you about us? What does that tell you about Americans? I don't know where it came from, Jim, but I just blurted out. Mr. Garrison, I know what my mother and father did to conceive me in the rumble seat of the car or on the pool table or in bed, but don't ever tell me my mother's not a virgin. Well, he howled and he said, you sound like my favorite American writer, Mark Twain, who said, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. And John, we've been fooled since November 22nd, 1963. So that's, and now I, you know what? We're running long, but I should tell you I had a second title. <laughs> Do you have time for the second title? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, because you brought it, I think you brought up uh, Wayne and Schuster earlier in the show. Didn't you mention them? Uh, I don't remember. Oh, well, I thought I heard you when you were talking about 
comics, I think you mentioned. But the second title I have, I loved. And I talk about it in the book. When I was uh, signed by, uh, to do Merv Griffin show and signed by his uh, agent, a guy named Murray Schwartz, who was just a young man who saved Merv Griffin's career. Great story in the book. He wanted to introduce me to a new team of managers. And the new team of managers was Jerry Weintraub, Bertie Burlstein. They turned out to be the most successful producers, entrepreneurs in Hollywood history. Jerry Weintraub with uh, the tours with Elvis Presley and a bunch of movies. And Bernie Burlstein owned almost everybody who was on Saturday Night Live. But they started out, they had nothing. And uh, the, other, the other fellow was an agent who had been the agent to uh, Jack, uh, Jack Parr. And uh, I said, oh my God, I wanna meet those guys. So in any event, I go meet them. And uh, the name of the agent site, uh, Bernstein, Brillstein, oh, if I, I don't want to look at the book to remember his name. Let's, let's say his name is Murray also. He had been the manager to Jack Parr. So naturally, that's a guy I want to manage me. But he's not there. Jerry Weintraub is there, and I don't like him a lot because the first thing he says, has Griffin made a pass at you yet? <laughs> I didn't even know that Merv was gay. I didn't want to hear about this. And Jerry was married to a very, very popular singer named Jane Morgan, who had the number one hit called Fascination. And he said that he could not sleep at night. It was just impossible for him to sleep because he'd be up all night thinking about my career. So I thought, oh my God, maybe I'll sign with these guys. But I really wanted Murphy the guy who handled Jack Parr. He said, well, he thinks he's going to quit the business. Why is he going to quit the business? He said, well, we all came from, uh, we all came from the William Morris office, okay? And when he left, uh, when we were breaking uh, apart to set up, uh, Murray was offered by Abe Lasfog, the head of the William Morris office, a chance to handle either big bands or tele or television. So he picked big bands and didn't do well. But at one point, he also managed um, Wayne and Schuster. Do you know that Wayne and Schuster appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show in New York 67 times? No one in the history of that show appeared successfully, as successfully as they did. Well, the heads of Universal Studios realized there was no war uh, Martin and Lewis, there was no more Abbott and Costello, no Laurel and Hardy contemporary. They needed a comedy team. And there was Wayne and Schuster on Ed Sullivan. So they called the manager and say, listen, we would love to have them come down and do a pilot. And if, they, if the pilot's okay, they will guarantee them 13 weeks uh, on American television, a series. So Murray, of course, calls uh, Johnny Wayne. Johnny Wayne is a spokesman for Wayne and Schuster and tells him about the offer. And Johnny said, Jesus, for God's sake, tell him that we're really happy here. We don't, we don't need to be on American television. We got a better deal on the CBC, so tell him we're happy, okay? So anyway, Murray calls back the head of Universal and Universal doesn't like to hear no. So they call back and they say, well, look, never mind the 13 weeks, we'll give them 26 weeks. And all they have to do is do the pilot. And so they'll make four or five times more money and more than equal what they make in Canada. So Mary calls Johnny back and tells him the story. And Johnny says, listen, both of our families are here. All our friends are here. And we are happy because we have total freedom of the show. And you can't get any happier than that as comedians to tell them no. So Murray, go Murray goes back to university and tells him no. And a week later, he gets a call. Forget television. Tell your goddamn clients we're going to make them movie stars. <laughs> we'll guarantee them one movie and two more after that. We've already looked into their contracts at the CBC. They're going to make 10 times more in just a few months with this one movie than they'll make in two years at that goddamn CBC. So tell them and get them signed up. 
So now Mercy thinking, oh God, I got a great commission. Oh, this is going to be fantastic. Uh -huh. He calls him. He knows that he will not say no and tells him the offer. And Johnny said, starts laughing. He says, my God, what is wrong with you people in America for crying out loud? We're just, now we have some grandchildren and we want our grandchildren to go to Canadian schools. We don't want them to go to American schools. Can't you see? We are happy here. And Murray screams at him. God damn it, Johnny, there's more to life than happiness. <laughs> and that, <laughs> and that would that, have been the second title to your book. That would have been the other title. And I thought about it a long time because I thought, God, that's such a showbiz story. So yeah. there you go. Anyway, thanks for giving me the extra couple of minutes to tell that story. Uh, and I was called the godfather of reality television only because of the power and the influence of real people. Aside from getting half of all the people watching television when it was on, I got, I played a major role in getting that Vietnam Memorial Wall built in Washington, D.C. We got the Missing Children's Act passed for uh, John Walsh, whose son Adams was beheaded and dismembered. Uh, in Florida, taken from the shopping mall, and we got a presidential citation for Ronald Reagan for the Navajo Code Talkers. We did more for America in three years than 60, uh, 60 minutes did in 35 years, and it was totally destroyed. You will read about the birth and the terrible destruction of the show by greed and ego in, in the book. So I take credit and take bows for being called the godfather of reality television but i would stay away from it now jim because when i got into television you had to have a modicum of intelligence a modicum of humanity and a modicum of a personality all of these three traits now could would keep you unemployed in american television the only thing you need now in reality television as you know from some of the shows i saw in canada all you need is an absence of shame. And reality television in the beginning was like the greatest bottle of wine. You uncork it and you leave it out there for 30 years, it turned to vinegar. I watched a, a episode with Terry Fox, man, it had me choked up all, I mean, Terry Fox was alive when I was younger, obviously, yes. and I remember it very well, but wow, he was so young and just so real. And it, that was a, that was, I, you know, I watched real people. I don't know if it was my parents or my, me and my brother that watched it, but it was huge in Canada. I can't remember what night it was on, but we never missed it. I think it was on Wednesday night. It was huge in Canada. As a matter of fact, I went up there to do a story about some priests who played hockey. Of course, I'm a hockey junkie, and I'm going to go and tell this story. I got off the train, and there were a 1,000 people. We were like the Beatles, for crying out loud. Jeez. We were, it was just unbelievable, oh. unbelievable. And uh, it was often difficult sometimes when we got to be well known to shoot in public because the crowds would become enormous. And I'm the only one in the history of Yankee Stadium who ever videotaped in Yankee Stadium without getting a license or permit to do so. John Barber, thank you so much. And thank you to John Pantalon, who's a friend of yours on Facebook that suggested I get a hold of you and that you'd be open to doing a discussion. And then, wow, it's so generous with your time and the availability. I really appreciate it, John. And, and, and John Pantalon that recommended that you come on the show was also right. He told me before I interviewed you today, I think this one's going to be a two-parter. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's funny. And what you need to do for me is you have to uh, friend me on Facebook, then mess. Oh, oh, one of the things that uh, about Facebook, you know, they had a CAPA conference. CAP is Citizens Against Political Assassinations in Dallas. They had it on Friday. The key speaker was Oliver Stone. If you go, uh, what I want you to do, I want you to Google an early Christmas gift from Oliver Stone. Oh, I saw it, but the audio- Because Oliver really Stone good. was videotaped by somebody who had a camera. Yeah, the audio is not very good, but you can hear it. Right. And he endorses the film. But what I want you to do is send me your address 
so I can send you an autographed copy of the book. Oh, I appreciate that, Mr. Barber. Thank you very okay. much. And I will touch you up again. Sorry about the technical issues. We got a late start today. You're more than welcome. Now your, your, your video is frozen and now your audio is freezing. Okay, Mr. Barber, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Be well. We'll talk soon, okay? Are we done? Yeah, we're done. We're all done. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, your, your, your video is freezing and I can't hear you. Okay. We'll talk soon. Well, I'm going to cut it. Sorry, John. I hate to cut well, you. Hate to do right. you like that, Mr. Barber. I have to say goodbye. Okay. Take care, Mr.